Hi, I'm Will Ochandarina, Product Manager with the Amazon Elastic File System team. For this storage day session, I'm going to be walking through what's new with Amazon EFS. We're going to start with a quick overview of what is EFS, then walk through what are the things that are new in 2020 with EFS, starting with new enterprise capabilities, then I'll walk through new things with integrations with other AWS services, and then I'm going to walk through performance enhancements that we've done this year. So let's talk about what is Amazon Elastic File System. Amazon EFS is a simple, elastic, shared file system for use from your AWS compute services. It's simple and highly reliable, simple because it's fully managed and fully elastic, and it's reliable because whenever you write data to Amazon Elastic File System, it's written to at least three availability zones, and it's available from any availability zone within the region. It's completely serverless because there's nothing that you need to manage, and it easily scales not only for storage space, but also for number of connections from your applications, as well as amount of throughput. And it's uh, performant. It ranges from your applications that are single-threaded latency sensitive to uh, high concurrency, high throughput applications. And it's cost effective because there are two storage classes available for your use. Those two storage classes together offer you a blended cost of eight cents per gigabyte month with Amazon Elastic File System. We have Amazon Elastic File System standard, which is 30 cents per gigabyte month for data that you are frequently accessing. And we have Amazon EFS infrequent access, which is 2.5 cents per gigabyte month for any data that you haven't touched uh, frequently. And we use uh, a feature called lifecycle management to tier data between EFS standard and EFS infrequent access automatically depending on your access patterns. So what we found is most customers achieve a blended price of eight cents per gigabyte month or less based on typical access patterns. So let's talk about the, some of the use cases for EFS. We've built EFS to be a general purpose shared file system appropriate for a wide range of use cases, everywhere from single threaded latency sensitive applications like home directories and developer tools like Jira, Git, all the way on the other side of the spectrum to uh, high concurrency throughput heavy use cases like analytics, media workflows like transcoding, and everything in between. And EFS is a critical part of a enterprise's migration into the cloud, no matter where they sit on that migration today. So we find that some customers start out with moving just some of their applications into the cloud, so they're doing a lift and shift of enterprise applications, where EFS is a very easy way to uh, move off of existing on-premises NAS uh, solutions, all the way to when customers are completely cloud native, developing new containerized and function-based applications using EFS as shared storage underneath those. As an example, Ancestry.com used EFS as part of their migration into the cloud. So as you may know, Ancestry.com provides personal genomic and family tree services to consumers. And as part of providing that service, they are very heavy on analyzing data and data science. And when they were using their on-premises solution, which involved physical servers and an Isilon storage system, they were having trouble scaling on demand to run those data science jobs that they were needing to run. By moving into AWS and utilizing EFS, they were able to increase their productivity as well as increase their agility in being able to expand their compute infrastructure and storage infrastructure on demand and get their analytics done faster. So now let's talk about what are the things that are new with Amazon Elastic File System in 2020. We've grouped these into three categories, enterprise capabilities, AWS integrations, and performance enhancements. I'm going to deep dive on several of these, but walking through some. So with enterprise capabilities this year, we increased our service level agreement from 99.9% .9 to 99.99%. Next, we introduced two new security features, IAM and access points. I'm going to deep dive on those on the next slide. And we increased the flexibility of 
EFS lifecycle management, allowing you to have a configurable uh, time frame after which data is transitioned from EFS standard to EFS infrequent access. Next, we launched many integrations in 2020 with other AWS services. We integrated with container services like Elastic Container Service, Elastic Kubernetes Service, and AWS Fargate. We integrated with AWS Lambda, and we simplified our integration with Amazon EC2. I'm gonna be talking about all of those in more detail coming up. We've also made several performance enhancements this year that I'm gonna be going over. So let's start with some of these enterprise capabilities, starting with IAM, integration and access points. What we've done is we've extended the NFS protocol and made it more cloud ready, more enterprise ready, by integrating it with the core of AWS security standards, by integrating with identity and access management. So now instead of using network-based policies to control which applications have access to which file systems, you can use the IAM role of a particular system or application to authorize access into Elastic File System. Not only that, you can authorize access specifically for read access, write access, or root access using this. So now you have more granular controls for access. On top of that, we built a new concept called uh, EFS access points. With EFS access points, you can get even more fine-grained control over which users can access which specific files and directories within your file system. We're gonna be deep diving on these in a upcoming reInvent session on Elastic File System security. So for integrations, let's start by talking about what we've done to simplify the process of attaching a EFS file system to EC2 instances. So earlier this year, we integrated with the EC2 launch instance wizard to make it possible to attach an existing EFS file system to the instance at launch time, drastically simplifying that process. Now we're excited to announce that now you can create file systems from that same workflow. So from the EC2 launch instance wizard, you can create a new file system using best practices. And not only that, we're going to, under the hood, properly configure the security groups to make sure that when that instance launches, it's gonna have the network connectivity it needs to use your EFS file system. Let's take a look at what the workflow looks like for that. So starting from step three of the launch instance wizard, you would click create new file system, which would bring up a box where the only thing you can optionally do is give a name to your file system so you can find it later. You would click create, and then that file system is created. So you add it to your instance, and you can see it right there in the instance box selected, and then that's it. Your EC2 instance will be connected to your EFS file system. Next, we integrated with both containers, with uh, Amazon Elastic Container Service and Elastic Kubernetes Service, and serverless with AWS Fargate and AWS Lambda. And typically what we see here is customers are modernizing their infrastructures by moving existing applications or extending existing applications by moving either all or parts of their code into containers or Lambda functions. However, what we find is many of these applications have traditionally required external persistent storage in, those, in the form of a SAN or a NAS. And with Amazon EFS integration with container and serverless services, those applications now can be modernized with containers or service serverless because they can connect to Amazon Elastic file system underneath. Now there's several benefits that compound when you add Amazon Elastic file system to these container serverless services. First is we've done these integrations in a way that is super simple. It was, it was our goal to make it so that application developers only have to think about their application logic, not any of the underlying infrastructure. So to do that, all of the configuration for Amazon Elastic file system happens within the task, function, or pod definition, the thing that the developer is working with. Next is the availability and durability model of EFS complements and uh, corresponds well with that of container and serverless services. So all of these services are regional, so your applications can be deployed in more than one availability zones or across an entire region, just like your data with EFS is available from any availability zone within a region. 
So that pairs up very well. All of these services are elastic, so now you don't have to worry about scaling of your application either from a compute or a storage standpoint. And we've done these integrations in such a way that take advantage of AWS best practices for security using IAM and access points that I just talked about. Here's an example of how you would configure a Lambda function to connect to your file system. It's really as simple as from the Lambda console, clicking Add File System, finding your file system from within the dropdowns, and hitting Save. So let's talk about some of the use cases that we commonly see for containers and serverless. So for containers, generally there's one of two reasons why you would want to connect an EFS file system. One is that you have an application that's long running and stateful and it needs to persist that state in something that's going to live longer than the container itself. In the other case, you have an application running in containers that needs to share data either with other scale out containers of the same type or with other components of the application. So some specific examples of these are developer tools like Jenkins, Jira, and Git all uh, are very containerizable and require this external persistent storage given by EFS. Web and content management systems like WordPress and Drupal are the same thing. And uh, machine learning often can be uh, containerized by using EFS uh, under the hood, either for the actual training of models using TensorFlow or MXNet in, in a scale out group that shares an EFS file system for training data, or for the associated tooling like uh, Jupyter Notebooks or Airflow for ETL. On the serverless side, typically what we see is there is a combination either of migrating existing applications into serverless in order to take advantage of the operational simplicity or the elasticity, or augmenting existing applications and adding new functions to them. So on the migration side, often what we see is web applications or API servers are easy to migrate over. And with EFS, you can have all of your concurrent invocations sharing a set of shared data. Uh, also, we see uh, batch type workloads now possible to do in Lambda, such as simulations or uh, other, other kind of batch uh, processing. For the augmentation side, what we see is, uh, on one hand, is uh, adding machine learning to existing applications. So doing machine learning if inference in a Lambda function and serving those inferences to a existing application. Or uh, something as simple as adding a virus scanning uh, subsystem to your application where everything gets funneled through your uh, Lambda function and an EFS file system. Let's walk through a couple of case studies of customers that have been successful using Amazon Elastic File System from containers and serverless, starting with a company called hosting solutions to customers for their blogs and websites and other digital properties. Previously, Acquia was using AWS, using EC2 instances, and self-managed storage. And what they wanted to do was uh, simplify their operations and make it possible to more easily scale with their customer demand. So what they've done is they've migrated their application into containers. They run the uh, Amazon Elastic Kubernetes service, EKS, and they use EFS under the hood to store the customer data for each of those websites and blogs. And in doing so, they've made it so that the footprint of each of their customers has gone down, they can deploy it more simply and scale them as those customers grow. Next, a company called Ashurion is using EFS in conjunction with Lambda to add new functionality. So Ashurion is a contracts for consumer electronics. So customer service is a big part of their business. What they wanted to do was get a better handle on what experience customers were having when they called in to assure in customer support. So they used machine learning to train a model on what the inflection was of a representative's voice to know whether the customer was having a good experience. And they wanted to serve that model and serve inferences using AWS Lambda so that it could elastically scale up and down as call volumes in their data centers or in their call centers went up and down as well. 
Now, the challenge that they had was their, the libraries that they needed for their inference function and their model file itself was too large to fit in, their, uh, in a Lambda function definition. So by using Amazon EFS, they're able to get access to as much storage as they need to run their inference function. And now they were able to uh, make that component a fully serverless component. Now, the last integration that I want to call out is updates to our integration with AWS Backup. Now, if you remember, AWS Backup is a service that makes it really simple to take backups of EFS file systems and other AWS storage resources, manage the life cycle of those backups, and if needed, restore those backups to your Amazon EFS file system. Now, we made an enhancement earlier this year that instead of restoring the entire file system, you can now specify an item that you would like to restore, either a file or a directory, and restore only what you need. So it shortens your time to recovery of any important data that you need. Now let's talk through some of the performance enhancements that we made this year. We know that performance is important to nearly every application that you're running, and we're always trying to make uh, improvements to your overall experience. And we've been making performance enhancements in three key areas. First, increasing the number of IOPS that you can drive from your application. Earlier this year, we announced a 5x increase in the number of read IOPS or read IO operations per second that you can perform on an Amazon Elastic file system. So this has been a huge increase for many applications out there, uh, most notably Jenkins and Git workloads, which are known to be very uh, IOPS heavy. Next, we've made a, a improvement to throughput, specifically the throughput that an individual application or client can access within EFS. We've doubled that throughput this year. And that's important for any time that you're trying to take a backup from a single instance of an application or when you're doing any analytics workflow where you just need as much throughput as you can get. And last, we've been working on what we call small file performance. So there's several applications out there that like to, do oper like to do lots of operations across lots of small files in a serial manner, one after the other. Git is a good example of this. Whenever you clone a repository, it's going to do an operation on either a read or a write operation on many files in sequence. So this is a key uh, metric that we are working on. Now we have doubled the performance of Git clone through several enhancements we've made under the hood this year. So far in this session, I've covered many of the notable launches that we had in 2020, but that wasn't all that we launched this year. I want to call your attention to a few of the other things that we did with this full list of what we launched and when. So as you can see, we had several region launches as well. In January, we launched in both China regions. In February, we launched in GovCloud East. And in May, we launched in the new AWS regions in Milan and in Cape Town. In July, we launched a completely new EFS console. And in the new EFS console, there are two key differences uh, from the former console. One is when you create a file system, you now have the option to quick create your file system using our best practices for performance, lifecycle management, and backup. And once that file system is created, you can monitor your file system from within the EFS console for throughput, IOPS, and burst credits. So I'd encourage all of you to give our uh, EFS console a visit and create a file system today and check it out. That concludes my presentation today for Storage Day. We look forward to continuing to talk to you and support you moving forward. Thank you.